So since the pandemic, there has been this phenomenon, whatever you want to call it, interesting trend uh, that has been taking place on social media, and it's being referred to as main character energy. Uh, if you were under 30, you might know what that is. If you're over 30, you might not. Uh, but people are describing main character energy in a few different ways. Uh, some people are describing it as a positive thing, that it is something like putting yourself first and making time for yourself. Other people have a little bit more negative light on it. They say that it's just wanting to be the center of attention and have everybody focused on you. But the common thread, no matter if you see it positively or negatively, is that people are describing main character energy as someone who sees themselves as the center of the story and then they act like it. Now, I'm convinced that main character energy isn't something that just started after the pandemic. It's something that we have all experienced, exhibited at some point in time in our life. But beyond that, it's something that's been around for a long time, a really long time. As a matter of fact, I think we can see some main character energy in the account of the Red Sea miracle that we started reading last week in Exodus chapter 14. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and go with me to Exodus chapter 14. While you're going there, let me catch you up a little bit on where we're at in this story. Uh, the nation of Israel uh, has become very numerous in the land of Egypt while they were slaves. And the nation of Israel were slaves in Egypt for around 400 years. God raises up Moses to go and rescue his people from Egypt and lead them out to the promised land. Pharaoh refuses to let the people go. And so God brings judgment on the nation of Israel through plagues culminating in the death of every firstborn child in the land out of a household that did not have the blood of a lamb posted over the door. Well, after that uh, judgment, after those plagues, Pharaoh relents, lets the people of Israel go, and they leave Egypt. However, God does not take them the short way to the promised land. As we saw last week, God takes them the long way into the promised land. And last week, we talked about why God would take them the long way. And we saw this. God takes them the long way, number one, because he knew what was down the road. There were dangers on the road that were shorter they didn't see, God did. God took them the long way because he knew what was still in the hearts of the people. He knew that if they faced those hardships early on, they would want to go back to Egypt. So he took them the long way. And finally, last week, we saw that God took them the long way because he knew that he was going to be going with them. And the best place that any of us can be is in the Lord's presence. And so when we feel like we are stuck in life and we're going the long way, we need to remember that sometimes the long way is a part of God. God's plan. But as God led them on the long way, God led the nation of Israel really to a dead end. They went around the Sinai Peninsula. They came up the eastern side where they were trapped in on one side by mountains and the other side by the Red Sea. And then Pharaoh changes his mind. He wants the Israelites back and he pursues them. And so now not only are they trapped between the mountains and the Red Sea, but they have the Egyptian army pressing in on them. Let's pick up our reading in Exodus chapter 14, starting in verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites to turn back and camp in front of Phi Hiroth, between Migdal and the sea. You must camp in front of Baal Zephon, facing it by the sea. Pharaoh will say to the Israelites, They are wandering around the land in confusion. The wilderness has boxed them in, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Then I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his armies, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this, right? They, they did what God said. They came back a little bit, backtracked a little bit, still trapped by the mountains and the Dead Sea, and they set up camp. Well, sure enough, God did harden Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh says, you know what? I want the people back. He gets all his best soldiers, all his best chariots, and he begins to pursue Israel. When Israel sees that he's coming, right, they begin to freak out and they turn on Moses and say, why did you bring us out here? It would have been better that we had died in Egypt. And in turn, Moses turns to God and cries out for help. Well, we pick up reading again in verse number 15 of Exodus 14, and we read this. Then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to break camp. 
As for you, lift up your staff, stretch out your hand over the sea, and divide it so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. As for me, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army and his chariots and horsemen. And the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So, here's what I think when I read that passage. When we think about this story of the miracle of the Red Sea, and we said last week, we, we know how this ends. This isn't a spoiler. God is going to part the Red Sea. Israel is going to go through on dry ground. God is going to make a way while they're stuck. But when we think about that story, knowing the ending... I think we all kind of default to thinking of Israel, or maybe Moses specifically, as the main character in the story, right? If you're over a certain age, when you think of the story, you think of Charlton Heston, who was playing Moses, as the main character. Or you think, if you're my age, the prince of Egypt, you think of Moses as the main character. But really, I think if we read the text more closely, it's pretty clear that, that that's just not the case. Israel, Moses even, they weren't the main character. If you still got your Bible open, go back and look at verses 4 and 17 and 18 specifically, because I think when you do, it's pretty easy to see that Egypt and Pharaoh, not Israel and Moses, were the focus of this miracle. Just look, it says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Then I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. That's verse 4. Or if we look again at 17 and 18, As for me, I'm going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his armies, chariots, and horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. So I think what's happening here is pretty clear. The parting of the Red Sea was for Israel. It was for their rescue. It was for their redemption. It was to save them and bring them into the promised land. The parting of the Red Sea was for Israel, but it was really about Pharaoh and Egypt. They were the ones that were being focused on, right? And I think when you kind of zoom out here on the broader story, it gets even more clear. Here's what I mean. When we start reading in Exodus chapter 14, the story's already been going for a while. I recapped it for you, but there's a lot there. And the first time that we see Pharaoh is in Exodus chapter 5, verse 2. And that is after God has told Moses to go to Pharaoh and tell him, the Lord says, let my people go. Let's just read Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says this, Later... Moses and Aaron went in and said to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go, so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh responded, Who is the Lord that I should obey him by letting Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. That's Pharaoh's opening words. It's kind of incredible. Especially when you understand that the phrase here, the Lord says, who is the Lord? I don't know the Lord. That phrase, the Lord, is really Yahweh. It is God's name. That is God's name. I am Yahweh. And Moses says, Pharaoh, Yahweh, the Lord God, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, who's Yahweh? I don't know Yahweh. I'm not letting the people go. So keep that in mind. Fast forward here to chapter 14, where basically God is telling Moses, I'm going to make sure Pharaoh knows who I am. I'm going to make sure Egypt remembers my name. I am Yahweh. And so I think there's a point that we need to learn from this that can really help us when we find ourselves stuck in life, right? Israel was stuck at the Red Sea, and like we said last week, we get stuck in life, whether in careers, and family, and relationships, whatever. Sometimes we just feel stuck. And I think the point that we need to learn from what we're looking at this week is that we're not always the main character, and that's okay. You know, I think 
that idea of main character energy is something that we've always felt, right? Sometimes we just feel like we're the main character. We're the point of the story. And sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're not the main character. Sometimes you're not the point of the story, right? Uh, God's miracle of parting the Red Sea was for Israel. It just wasn't primarily about them. They weren't the main character in this story. They were just a side character. And the truth is that much of what's going on in our lives may be more directly about what God is doing in somebody else's life. And we need to learn to be okay with that. It doesn't always have to revolve around us. It doesn't always have to be about us. It it really is okay to be the supporting character every now and again. Uh, Let me just read to you an excerpt from a blog written by Madison. And that's the only way that she identifies herself as Madison. No pastor, no theologian, not even probably a believer. But this is what she writes in her blog. I want you to listen. She said, we aren't just living in our universe. We live in every universe that every person has created within their minds, which means we aren't truly the main character. We are a thousand different versions of side characters. According to the New York Times, the average person knows about 600 people, and let's just say that each person represents their own story. Well, that means that in our lives, we play the side character about 599 times, and we're only the main character once. But even so, our actions, our words, and our presence are all influential to all of these stories. Every story, every person is interconnected. And understanding this, understanding our role in other people's lives is way more important than living in a way in which our story is the only one that matters. And I think that's such a good word. That it's okay to not be the main character. It's okay just to be a part of someone else's story and bring some humor to their story, bring some comfort to their story, bring some love to their story. It's okay that what's going on in your life may be more directly about what God is doing in someone else's. We're not always the main character, and that's okay. But I think there's even a greater danger at play here. You see, if we fall into the trap of becoming the main character, well, by default, that means that God isn't. Let me say that one more time. If we're the main character, God isn't. Now, maybe you already picked up on this. Maybe you missed it. It's fine. But even Pharaoh, even Egypt, they weren't the main character. Sure, they are the focus of the main character, right? It was for Israel. It was about Egypt. They are the focus of the main character, but they aren't the main character. God himself is the main character in the story of the Red Sea. He is the one who acts. He is the one who parts the Red Sea. He is the one who rescues Israel. He is the one who destroys the Egyptians. God is the main character. God is the one who acts, and when he acts... He acts for his glory. Again, look at verse 4. I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Then I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his army. Again, 17 and 18. As for me, I am going to harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go after them. And I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh, all his army, his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I receive glory. So God is the main character in this story. God is the one who is acting on both Israel and the Egyptians. And God is doing it so that he himself would receive glory. I think that this is even more clear as the psalmist writes it in Psalm 106 verse 7 and 8. This is what the psalmist says. He says, our ancestors in Egypt did not grasp the significance of your wondrous works or remember your many acts of faithful love. Instead, they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea, yet you saved them for your name's sake to make your power known. That's incredible. God acted for the sake of his name, for the sake of his glory. So what do we mean there? When we say God's glory, if you didn't grow up in church, you might not know what that means. Heck, if you grew up in church, you still might not know what that means. It's a word we use, but we're not sure exactly what it means. 
Well, God's glory is really his magnificence, his worth, his loveliness, his grandeur, his many perfections. All of that is the glory of God. But really, the the literal meaning of the root word here in Hebrew is the idea of heaviness or weightiness. Right, God's glory is his heaviness. God's glory is his weightiness. And while that may sound different to our ears and to our minds, I really think there's a clue here to what we really have to see and learn in this passage. You see, the main character is the one who carries the weight of the story. The story rises and falls on the shoulder of the main character. And when we try to be the main character in our lives, we feel that weight sooner or later. Like you've been there, right? You feel the weight when you think that it all revolves around you. That's why being stuck bothers us so much. Because we feel the weight, we feel the burden, we feel the heaviness of all of that. But the truth is, you and I weren't designed to carry the weight of being the main character. You weren't made for that. Only God himself can carry that kind of weight. And see, I think this is good news, because when we begin to see God as the main character of our story, it actually frees us. It takes that weight, it takes that heaviness off of us. I think this this revolutionizes everything. You see, we talk about the gospel all the time, right? The gospel, the good news of Jesus coming to this earth, taking our place, our punishment on our cross so that we might receive forgiveness of sins and his righteousness. But if you see that story, the story of the gospel is primarily about you, you're going to feel the weight of it. You see, the gospel is for us But it's about Jesus. He's the one who carries the weight, not us, right? If we carry the weight, when we're doing really good, coming to church, reading our Bible, praying, we feel awesome. We feel like we're rock stars. But when we fall, when we stumble, when we sin, that weight crushes us. Does God love me? Do I deserve any of this? But it's because we think we're the main character. Look, the gospel is for us, but Jesus is the main character. It's not about what we do or have done. It's about what Jesus has done in our place, bearing our sin, bearing our punishment, uh, giving us his righteousness. Jesus carries the weight of that story. Even more than that, our story was never really our story to begin with. You see, we are all... In God's story. All of human history is God's story. That's why it's called history. His story. It's the story of creation and how God created a perfect world so that he might uh, receive glory from his creation. It's about how that creation through Adam and Eve and their deliberate choice to rebel against God fell. And that sin and rebellion broke the world. That story is about how God set up a plan for rescue where he would send his one and only sinless son to redeem and restore everything that sin broke through his sacrificial death and victorious resurrection. And it is about an ultimate restoration that is coming one day where every bad thing is going to be undone. Every tear will be wiped away and God will ultimately fix all that sin broke and grace will restore more than sin has taken away this has always been God's story and the amazing part is that we are invited to have a part in that story and not just any part but a meaningful part we can have a relationship with God We can take the message of his good news to the ends of the world. Very literally, eternity can look different because of us. We get to be a part of his story. But, you know, when we get stuck, when we get stuck in life, we kind of fall into that temptation of making everything all about us. Nobody's ever had it as bad as we have. Everything is focused on us. It's all about us. 
And instead of that focus making us feel better, it just adds more weight onto our shoulders that we have to carry. But today, I hope you see through God's word, you're not meant to carry that weight. You're not the main character. God is the main character. And when you realize that we are just playing our part in his story and that the end of that story has already been written, we can experience freedom. We can experience contentment. And I believe we can even experience joy while we're stuck because we know it's his story and we're just playing our part. But when we try to live as the main character, we're ultimately robbing God of his rightful position and his rightful glory. He's the only one who can carry the weight because he's the only one who is truly glorious. So let me encourage you. When you're feeling stuck, even when you're not, let's take the spotlight, let's take the camera off of ourself and let's shine it on Jesus, who is the main character of the story of history and has invited us to be a part. Let me pray for you. God, thanks for the time that you've given us today to look at your story. And God, I pray that today, You would help us to let go of the need to be the center of it all. That we would find freedom and contentment and joy by realizing that you're at the center. You're the main character. This is your story. And we are just grateful that you've given us a part. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.